It's like the same unit as unit five from your you Max Man Ash one class. So you might already remember a lot of these things, which is kind of nice. Two Man Ash two, I don't think you remember as much. I can't remember. So we're talking about rational expressions. Before we start talking about rational expressions, I like to talk about rational numbers because it helps us remember what things are. So what's a rational number? Does anyone remember? What's a rational number? Close. Uh, Max answer was a number that doesn't repeat. Uh, it could repeat as long as it's forever. Basically, a rational number is anything that can be written as a fraction. So this thing right here, that's a rational number because it can be written as a fraction. And so that's like basically any number, right? Like as long as it's not something crazy like the number of pi or the square root of 2 or something like that. Almost anything can be written as a fraction. Rational expressions are the same thing. Rational expressions are fractions. So instead of the fractions having numbers on the top and the bottom, they will have letters on the top or the bottom. So for instance, 2 divided by x would be a rational expression. It's a fraction, but now it has a letter on the bottom rather than a number. That's all we're talking about this year, the distractions. Today what we're going to do with those fractions is we're going to learn something called non-permissible values, and then we're also going to learn how to simplify fractions. If you've been simplifying fractions on your calculator when it's just rational numbers, now you're going to simplify fractions by hand because they're going to have letters involved. So it gets a little bit harder. Uh, right here it says, here's three examples of rational expressions. So all three of these things count as rational expressions. And you look, it's because all three are fractions. All three have letters on the bottom or the top. And then there's a few other rules that matter. So for instance, like there's no square root in the exponents or no negative values in the exponents, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, what you're looking for is fractions with letters on the top or the bottom. That's what a rational expression is. Rational expressions have to follow certain rules that we already know about fractions. We already know some rules about fractions. We have one big rule in particular that we know about fractions. And what is that rule? Fractions are just divide signs. And what do we know about division? Read the first sentence and it'll give it away. Can't divide by zero. So the big rule in math is that you can't divide something by zero, meaning that the denominator cannot be zero. That rule that we use for rational numbers is the same rule we have to use for rational expressions. You can't divide by zero. Uh, if you've been in my math 10 class, we then do the little thing on Siri where you ask it to divide by zero and it says you can't do it and it makes fun of you. Exactly, yeah. The idea is you can't divide by zero because dividing is breaking something into groups. So if I wanted to take you four students and break you into zero groups, that doesn't make sense. And then where did you go, right? You had to have gone somewhere. You can't still be there or you'd be a group of four, but you didn't go into the group, so it doesn't it really make sense. Vanish. So can't divide by zero is the rule that we're going to follow. And I'll tell you what, every question we do starting today, the first step is something called your non-permissible values. Okay, so your first goal is to always list what your non-permissible values are. Non-permissible values are numbers that cause you to divide by zero. So for instance, if you look at this slide, it says, here's an expression x plus 5 divided by x minus 3. And if I said you're not allowed to divide by 0, then you look at the bottom and you say if I'm not allowed to divide by 0, then x isn't allowed to be 3. 
because 3 minus 3 would be 0, and then I would be dividing by 0. So that x can't equal 3, we call that a non-permissible value, or an n, p, v. You cannot divide by 0. And our goal is to figure out every time that happens. Here's an example where it says, what are the non-permissible values for this equation? So, to figure out the non-permissible values, you have to figure out everywhere you have division. My division is everything in the denominator right here. And I need to figure out the numbers that would cause me to divide by zero. To do that, I'm going to use something called the zero product property. And you should have heard of that before as well. And the zero product property is anything times zero equals zero. So if I had one million times zero, the answer is still zero. And you'll notice on this question that my denominator is two binomials, there's one of them, the second one, multiplied together. So that means if one of them equals zero, the whole thing's going to equal zero. Because zero times anything would be zero. So you're going to look at both of these binomials separately, and you're going to ask yourself, what makes that binomial equal zero, and what makes that binomial equal zero? The first one is x plus 7. What value would make that equal zero? Negative 7. Negative 7 plus 7 equals 0. 0 times whatever that binomial would have been is still 0. Now I look at the second binomial and I say, what would make that binomial equal 0? Plus. If I had 3 minus 3, that's 0. 0 times anything is 0. That's dividing by 0. Not allowed. So my NPVs. are negative 7 and I'm going to call them NPVs a lot. Uh, Non-permissible values is what it stands for. Alright. Here's four questions where you need to solve for the NPVs, the non-permissible values. And if you look at that first question, that thing is going to be hard to figure out. So if I'm asking myself, what makes this bottom thing equal to zero? I could guess and check some things. I'd be like, okay, what if I put two in there? Two actually works. What if I put three in there? Well, three squared minus three minus six equals, oh my god, that works. Zero. So that actually would work. I could guess again and say, what if I put four in there? Four minus four minus six. Uh, equals, I'll get equals, and you could guess and check a whole bunch of things, and you'd never know if you have all the answers or not. So, for instance, I just figured out accidentally that three works, but that doesn't mean three is the only number that would work. So, there's got to be an easier way, right? There's no way that you're solving these things by guessing and checking. There's no way. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to try to always turn the denominators into multiplication questions. So how do you take a trinomial and turn it into multiplication? You factor it. So you're going to have to factor every question. Your first step to every question is going to be factor. That's why when we spent a whole day factoring and I gave you three, four, five, six, seven pages, I think, of factoring practice, I said, you better be good at factoring. Because it's the first step to every single question that we took. So if I factor this bottom, I'm going to have negative six on the top. I'm going to have negative one on the bottom. The things that multiply be negative six and add to be negative one would be negative three and two. That means this bottom thing would factor to become x minus 3, x plus 2. 
For this unit, it might be really wise to just always have a notebook or paper where you can do some factoring on the side, or else you're going to kind of run out of room sometimes. And so if you need to do diamonds and show your work and factoring, you've seen it. Factoring can take a lot of room, right? So it might just be a good idea to have space to always be factoring. I try my best to give you space, but I mean, I also don't want to print off like 17 different like packages that are this good, just so you have space. Now that I've factored it, look at my denominator. That's something I can figure out. I have a binomial times a binomial. And I know if I times anything by zero, it's zero. So what would make this first binomial equal to three? So that means three is going to be one of my non-permissible values. And what's going to be my other non-permissible value? Negative two. So my NPPs equal 3 and negative 3. Those are values that x is not allowed to be. If x was those values, you'd be dividing by 0. That's not allowed. All right, we look at the second one. We want to try to factor that thing. If we tried to factor that thing, can we factor it? If you remember yesterday we had a little chart, the first thing you would do is a GCF. You can't GCF that denominator. The second thing you try to do is you try to do a diamond method because there's two terms here. You can't, sorry, difference of squares method because there's two terms here. You can't do difference of squares because it's not a subtraction. So that means this can't be factored, which means from this point right here, you must be able to figure it out. Does anybody have any suggestions of what that NPV would be for this system? Zero and negative one are two very popular answers. I'm glad that you said both of them. I'm hoping they both get said. So, negative one is usually what people go with as their first guess. And if they try in their calculator, and we're actually going to try it, and I'm going to punch it in my calculator right now to show you just a good thing. So, negative 1 squared plus 1 equals 0. So, negative 1 is not allowed. Except, that's wrong. Because negative 1 squared in your calculator, you have to put brackets around it. Right? Negative 1 squared equals what? Positive 1. Positive 1 plus 1 is 2. So, negative 1 does not work as an answer because when you square a negative number, it makes it positive. Am I ever going to have a negative number in this first term? The answer is no. That square is always going to create a positive number. That's what squares do. A positive number plus a positive number is always going to equal a positive number. I'm never going to be able to make that thing equal zero. So this would be no and Because I would never be able to make that bottom equal zero. The other answer that Bronwyn said was zero, and that's the other answer that would be commonly said. So I was hoping to hear negative one and zero. So you did perfect. <laughs> A lot of people will look at this. And they'll see that there's an x on the bottom, and they like to jump to the conclusion that 0 obviously can't be alone because x was on the bottom by itself. You can always test your NPVs to see if it works. So if we tested 0 in here, and we went 0 squared, it's equal to 0. But then you have to add 1 to that result, so then your denominator would be plus 1. So 0 also would. Okay, next 2, you can try on your own. So see if you can get the non-permissible values for those two questions. You're going to have to factor, and you can factor both of them, okay? So remember, difference of squares and diamond method are the two things you're looking for. Factor both those things up here. So the very first one, when I look at x squared minus 9, first step is GCF, there is no GCF. Second step is figure out, oh, I have two terms, that means I have a difference of squares, I have to square root the x squared, square root the 9. And that gives me x plus 3, x minus 3. Remember, you have 1 to the plus and 1 to the minus. 
So that means your NPVs, if you did that properly, equals positive or negative 3. And that's how we would write out the answer typically. I could write it 3 comma negative 3 and split them up, but a lot of the time what you'll see is this plus minus symbol in front of the number. And that just means positive 3 or negative 3. It means both things. Okay? The next one, if you did it, you had to use a diamond method to solve it. You should have got negative 4 and negative 4. So your non-permissible value would equal positive 4. Right? And it would be positive 4 for both of these binomials. You don't have to say that the NPV is 4 and it's 4. You've already told me x can't equal 4 once, so it obviously can't equal it again. So no matter how many times it shows up on the bottom, you just write it once. Right. Equivalent rational expressions. So up until this point, all we've done is we have calculated NPVs. And we're still going to do that. So if we looked at a question like this, I could figure out my NPVs are negative 2 and 4. Right? Negative 2 would make the first set of brackets 0, 4 would make the second set of brackets. But now what you could do is you could simplify that rational expression. Uh, that's usually what we do. You could also make it more complex, I guess, and I'll show you how to do that. But the main thing we do is we simplify. The first step to simplifying is to make sure you have brackets around everything. So, like, if, for instance, you notice already that they put brackets around their denominators and they put a bracket around their denominator. What they're doing is they're showing you all the things that are multiplied together. And they're doing something that I refer to as calling things package deals. So for instance, this x plus 2 on the bottom, like it's stuck together. It's like a package. And this x minus 4, like it's stuck together. It's a package. So when we go to simplify things, we're trying to cancel out entire packages. So I'm going to look to see if there's a package on the top that's the exact same as one of the packages on the bottom. And you'll notice that there's an x plus 2 on the top in brackets and an x plus 2 on the bottom in brackets. We say that they cancel each other. x plus 2 divided by x plus 2 would equal 1. So they cancel each other out. And this rational expression could be simplified to be 3 divided by x minus 4. And I still leave it in brackets because it's a package deal. The only way I can get rid of that x minus 4 is if I get rid of another x minus 4. That would be simplifying to get similar expressions. You could also do other things to get similar expressions. So for instance, if I wanted to, instead of cancel things out, I wanted to include more things into it, what I could do is I could multiply the top and the bottom by anything I want. And as long as I did the same thing to the top that I did to the bottom, it would be equal. So for instance, I could times the top by x and times the bottom by x. And whatever my result is would still be a rational expression that's equal to the first one. We don't really do that very often. What we do instead is we always are simplifying things to make them more easy to read, not more complex to read. Okay, second one's yours. Simplify that thing. Write out an equivalent rational expression to that one. Do your NPVs change because the four cancel? Uh, yeah, we haven't really talked about that yet, but your NPVs are always done before you cancel things. cancel things out, you should have seen there was an entire x minus 1 that could have been cancelled on the top of the bottom. And that would have left me with just an x plus 5 on top, and then the 2 on the bottom. Those things can't be cancelled in any way because the x plus 5 is Alright, Tete asked a good question, and it was about NPVs. So the first question she said was, when do I do my NPVs? And I said, you do your NPVs before you cancel things out. We're going to talk more about that in a second. The second good thing she asked was, 
Does the two do anything to land fields? Now, what you need to focus on is things that are being multiplied together. So this, this two is one thing. It stands on its own. This x minus one is another thing that's being multiplied. It stands on its own. So what you're asking yourself is how could you make that thing equal zero? Just that thing. The x minus one, we know how to make that zero. We say x equals one. Is there any value of x that's going to change this two? And the answer is no, because there is no x in that first term. There's no way of altering that two. That two will always be two. The only way to change it is by changing the other thing. Okay, so the NPVs here would be just one. Yeah. If uh, it goes to x, could you say the NPV is zero? Yeah. So the way that this can change sometimes is if it looked like this. Now your things are 2x and x minus 1. And that is something I could make equal 0. Because 0 times 2 would be 0. So I could change that first thing to be 0 by making x 0. So these are two different situations. Um, on the top, if there was a 2x, so I could do x plus 5. Yeah, I'm ready to do some of those. Yeah. If not, I'll talk about it. Uh, rational expressions in simplest form. So, you're going to hear me say that you always need to write things in simplest form. That means you need to cancel out as many things as possible in your expressions. You want it to always be written the easiest way it possibly is to be written. Before we simplify, we're always going to write out our NPVs every single time. Okay? So, you need to understand that we're going to simplify here. <coughs> but the first step is still NPV. Looking at this first question, we want to write out all the NPVs to get things started. We look at the bottom, it's already broken up into all multiplication. There's no addition or subtraction down there. So you ask yourself, what things could make those equal zero? And I would say X cannot equal zero, Y cannot equal zero, and Z cannot equal zero. Those are my NPVs. They're not allowed. If any of them were zero, then you'd be dividing by zero. After I've done my NPVs, now I start canceling things out. When you're canceling things out, you're looking for things that multiply together, right? Everything on the top multiplies, everything on the bottom multiplies, so now I can take things out of everywhere. I'm going to look at my numbers first, my coefficients. My 15 and my 20 can simplify. It simplifies to 3 over 4, but if you're not good at that, what you can do is you can put 15 divided by 20 into your calculator and go math frac. And that'll tell you what number should go on the top and what number should be left on the bottom. And the answer is going to be 3 and 4. Okay, so by using math frac, you can figure out what the coefficients need to be. The reason they become 3 and 4 is because they can both be divided by 5. 5 is the biggest number that goes into 15. 5 is the biggest number that goes into 20. So a 5 can come out of both those things. The next thing you do is you focus on letters. And the way I like to describe this, well, this one's actually pretty easy, is you just subtract the exponents. So whatever you have on top, you minus the number of them on the bottom. So for instance, if I have x squared on the top and 1x on the bottom, I go 2 minus 1, and that will give me 1x left on the top. Now I do my y's. If I have 1y on the top and 1y on the bottom, 1 minus 1 would be... Zero, that means I'm left with no y's. They cancel out. If I have z to the power of 3 on the top and z to the power of 1 on the bottom, I go 3 minus 1, we have the z squared. That would be your 
your simplified rational expression. You don't usually end up with monoreals and divide by monoreals. Um, exponent laws, when we're doing those subtractions, sometimes what you end up getting is more than just like a simple one like z e to the power of 2. That's a pretty easy one. Sometimes you're going to get like z to the negative 6, and that usually screws people up. So, for these types of questions, what I like to do it is something that is not mathematical at all. I like to play video games, and in video games, I like to play war games. And so, for instance, if I have like 10 things and you have 10 things and they fight each other, they cancel each other out, right? Like in Risk. So, if you ever played the board game Risk, that's how it works. I take my 10 armies, I fight your 8 armies, I win because I had more armies than you. But your 8 armies kill 8 of my armies and I only have 2 left. Same thing with exponents. So, I like to picture these things as armies fighting each other. So, if I have z to the power of 3, that means I have 3 z armies. And they fight the 1 z army on the bottom. That means they're going to fight and the 2 z armies on the top are going to be left alive and win. And that's why I have z to the power. Weirdly enough, that works really well for some people. And I've seen people do a lot of high-level math with this weird little army game that I've created in my mind. So, if that helps explain to you why things are the way they are, then use that trick. Because it works. Okay, second one. We're going to try to make that in simplest form. First thing we're always going to do is write out our NPVs. What's our NPV for this thing? What can make that bottom equal zero? If x equals zero. So we say x cannot equal zero. Next thing we do is we try to see if we can cancel things out. Now, I like to cancel things out from multiplication stage. This is not a multiplication. This is just subtraction. To change things into multiplication, we factor. And you're going to try to factor the top now as well. Up until right now, we've only ever factored the bottom. We're going to factor the top and the bottom if possible, all the time. So if I go to factor that top, I can take a GCF out. What's the GCF that can come out? I can have an X come out. That leaves me with 3X minus on the bottom, I can take out nothing, so it's still just 2x. The reason I like to do it this way, one, is I get to check my packages and see if any of them can cancel out. So for instance, my 3x minus 8 can't cancel with anything, because there's not another 3x minus 8 anywhere. The second thing I like to use this method for is it gives me coefficients. So it gives me that x right there as a coefficient. And coefficients can cancel with other coefficients. And on the bottom, since it's a monomial, that means this thing is a coefficient. So these x's can cancel each other out. Because they're both coefficients. They're both on the outside of everything. Neither one of them is added or subtracted to anything. That means my new answer is going to be 3x minus 8 by All right, last one. This is a perfect example of what you might actually end up getting on a test. And we're going to th follow our rules. And our rules are we need to figure out our NPVs. To figure out your NPV, you got to factor. So I'm going to factor my bottom, but I'm also going to factor my top while I'm at it because I know I'm going to have to factor my top to cancel things out anyway. So I'm going to factor my top by doing a different square. So I'm going to have 4 minus x and then 4 plus x. Divide by. I'm going to have to do diamond method. So we're going to look for things that multiply to be 24 and add to be negative 11. Negative 3 and negative 8. 
And remember, we're going to give you, I'll write it up on the side. Like I said, it's good to have a little bit of piece of paper. So I would write that as 2x minus 3 and 2x minus 8. And I have to divide one of those by 2. Okay, I put the 2 in front of both because my a value is 2. And I get rid of one of my 2's by dividing it. So my bottom should be from 2x minus 3 x First step was factor. The reason I factored was to do my second step, which was find my NPVs. My NPVs come from my denominator. I try to figure out what value would make something equal zero. This one's pretty easy. That is, x cannot equal 4. The other one's not so easy. So to do that 2x minus 3, what I have to do is I'm going to do on x minus 3 equals 0, right? I've been saying this over and over. 2x minus 3 equals 0. That's what we want to have happen. So I like to write that on the side of my paper. 2x minus 3 equals 0. That's what we're trying to figure out. What value of x would make this equal 0? And for hard ones like this, where I can't just look at it and see it, I write it out, and then I solve for x. I solve for x by adding 3 to both sides. So then I have 2x equals 3. And I divide both sides by 2. And I get x equals 3 over 2. And that tells me my second non principal problem. So this is another reason why carrying a notebook is good for you. One, you're factoring. It's nice to have scrap paper. Two, to calculate your NPVs, sometimes just takes a little bit of work. Because those binomials can be hard to fix sometimes. So, 3 over 2 is 1. First step was factor. Second step was NPV. Third step is now simplify. Any package you have on the top can cancel with any package you have on the bottom. Do we have any packages that are identical? They have to be identical. Do we have any packages that are really close? Yeah. We've got x minus 4 and we've got 4 minus x. Those things are really close. In fact, they're so close they're complete opposites. So they're this 4 is positive. The 4 in the denominator is negative. The x in the, in the numerator is negative, but the x on the denominator is positive. They're complete opposites of each other. Not quite. The 4 plus x is really close too, but one of them's off, right? Where with these two that I've circled in the black, I'm going to circle in the red so they get a little better. These two, the reason we're focusing on them is they're both completely backwards. And you can change the signs in something. When in math have we ever seen us change signs? When we're like, that changes all the signs. What do we do? Multiply by a negative one. So in math, we know we can change all the signs in a set of brackets by multiplying by a negative one. So I'm going to change one of the signs. I'm going to change the one on the top. I'm always going to change one on the top. I prefer negatives on top of one. When I go negative 1, it changes the signs on the inside to be negative 4 and now plus x. And now those packages are the same. This is minus 4 plus x. This is plus x minus 4. That's the same thing. Just reordered. Now they can cancel. 
Did you change the other four plus x? No, you only change one of them. That's a good point, too. So if I multiply by negative 1, it's just a 1 of the binomials. That means my new answer is going to be negative 4 plus x divided by 2x minus 2. <laughs> That is my simplified solution to this question. In your curriculum of things you need to know, that question with that negative trick is explicitly written in there. And you have to know how to take a negative out. So that's why we do this example, because they make it explicit. You have to know it, which means that is a fair game question for them out of the phone. With that particular trick. All right, here's four questions for you. I want you to try all four. You might need some scrap paper to do some factoring. Across the top is reminding you of your three steps to every question. Factor, NPV, simplify. Okay, so do all three of those steps. Sometimes you can't factor, but most of the time you can. The first one you can't factor because they're both monomials, top and bottom. Every other one after that you can factor. If we look at these, so we look at the first one. The first one is a monomial divided by a monomial, so you can't factor, right? You can't factor a monomial. You can only factor things that are bigger than monomials. So right away, all you have to do it is your simple coefficient, right? Simplification. So I always like to start with my coefficients. So 25 divided by 35, that gives me negative 5 divided by 7. Those can be divided by 5, so that's exactly what I did. The next thing is I went letter by letter. My A's, my G's, my C's, they all paired up. Should have given you A squared and C on the top, and C and R squared on the bottom. <coughs> I also wrote out my NPVs that A cannot equal 0 and B cannot equal 0. The second fraction, I followed my three steps. I'm also going to give you a, a piece of advice. So, I factored it to get this. And then I checked my NPVs, because that's what you're supposed to do before simplifying. And I wrote my NPVs right at the top next to where my question started. The reason why I suggest that you do that is when you do work in your practice booklet or in your unit assignment or on a test or a quiz, you want to be able to find your NPV really easily. So I always write mine right beside the question so that it's easily found. I just look back to where my question started and I go, oh, there's my NPV. If I write it right here where I found it, then I'm probably going to lose it in the mass chaos that will become some of these questions. So just a piece of advice, write it somewhere that you always will find it. I just write it always at the start. Uh, when you factored it, you should have got 6x as a coefficient. That means that these coefficients can pair up. The 6s go together to become 2 and 1. I would never write divide by 1. Just saying. So I only put it there to like show you that the 1 is there, and that's where it went. And the x is to cancel out the coefficients. Notice that the x that's inside the brackets does not cancel out because it's part of a package. The next one, simple, again, factor it, right, again, please, the whole package has to cancel out. The fourth one's a little trickier. After you factored it, you got that situation where you had things that were opposite of each other. So I have a x minus 3, they have a 3 minus x. So I need to change one of those to be the same. To change it, you need to change all the symbols on the inside. To do that, you multiply by negative 1. I always do it to the top, okay? which makes my life easier if I do it to the top. Just for the record, please talk to anybody else, uh, any other math teacher. I'm saying I multiply by negative 1. The uh, other terminology you could use, which you should use, if you factored out a negative one. It's the same thing, okay? So nothing's different. But what you're doing is you're taking a negative one out of the brackets. I just show it as multiplication. It's the same, same thing. I just feel when I say multiply by negative one, people understand what that means. So that's why I say that.
the negative 1 that I multiplied by is still in my final answer. See the little negative sign on the other side? That's important too. It's still got to be there. Okay, our last two problems are uh, good little multiple choice questions. Okay, so it's review. So I want you to try both of them. Uh, the first one you're going to have to solve on your own, so try to figure out what the NPVs are. The second one, you're going to have to go and test all the statements to see which ones are true. So check to see if they simplified properly, and check to see if they stated their NPVs properly. So you go ahead and do the exact same thing, I'll put my answer on the board. Okay, so I'm going to talk through them. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to just practice on this stuff before you run away. So the first one, here at the NPVs, the first step is always factor. I factor the top and the bottom because it's just going to happen. Uh, when I factor the bottom, I get x plus 3, x minus 2. I diamond method with that. And hopefully by this point in today, you realize how important factor is. If this is the easiest stuff we do, and factoring is still that important, then when we get moving, you need to be good at factoring. You can't be making your errors in your factor. So please practice your factoring. When I do that, I get x plus 3, x minus 2. That means my NPVs are negative 3 and positive 3. If you look at number 2, I pointed out the errors in each one. And we're going to talk about the errors in each one because they're common mistakes. A and D uh, make pretty similar mistakes. Okay? Let's talk about A. Let's go with D first. So, the error that they made in D is they got it down to x minus 5, and they said that the NPV is minus 5. And that's incorrect. The NPV for this thing would be positive 5, not negative 5. So that's a common error, is that people just see the minus 5 and they write it. In A, they make another common error. They factored that thing, and they factored it properly. They factored it to be x plus 1, x minus 1, divided by x plus 1, x minus 5. Eight of one eight. They factored it properly. Maybe they canceled it out properly. So they said the minus 1s cancel, and they left with plus 1 and then minus 5, which they did correctly. And then they stated their NPV, what looks correct. Why is their NPV not 5? Yeah, so 5 is one of your NPVs, but they canceled out their other NPV right here. And you state your NPVs before you cancel things out. So the proper answer should have been 5 comma 1, which is right below. So that's why I think it's neat. If you look at C, something they did, which is very, very common, please don't be someone who does this, is they looked at their question, and they didn't factor. And instead, they just started canceling things out. And they said, well, there's an x squared on the top, an x squared on the bottom, cancel it. And left me with negative 1 and then negative 6x plus 5. And I guarantee someone's going to do that. Okay? You cannot do that. You can only factor out entire packages after you have factored. If I could cancel out my x squared minus 1, the whole thing at once, I would have done it, but I couldn't. So I had to factor first, and then NPVs, and then cancel things. Alright, that's simplifying rationals. Tomorrow we're going to do more simplifying, but we're going to...